Uh, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, a different type of drilling for oil. I took over as CEO in uh, summer of 2010 and decided to head to America. Probably like all good Irishmen, uh, I'm drawn there uh, in a magnetic manner. Uh, but I started knocking on the doors of land-based casinos, and there are a thousand land-based casinos in America in 48 states out of the 50. I think it's uh, only Hawaii and Texas that doesn't have either a commercial casino or a Native American casino inside it. And it struck me as slightly odd in 2010, when we're in the middle of the, the age of the, inter the internet, that a lot of these land-based casinos did not, in fact, have any online casino experience available on their websites. They had websites that would give you directions on how to find their enormous buildings stuffed full of typically two to 3,000 slot machines and 50 to 100 table games like blackjack and video poker and other forms of table games. But they didn't have anything beyond that. Uh, simplistic websites with directions. Maybe you could see if there was a slot tournament going on this weekend or if there's a special buffet discount going on during the course of the holiday season. And in discussion with these American uh, executives, these casinos, they laid a challenge at my foot and they said, Dermot, our problem is the laws of America don't permit us to do online internet casino gaming. And of course, they're absolutely right. And if any of you were investors, in exciting online gambling companies before 2006, or specifically October 2006, I hope you made a lot of money, and I hope you got out of those stocks. Because in October 2006, the mother of all crackdowns came down and, sh and took $5 billion worth of equity off the market capitalizations of a lot of very large internet casino, poker, and sports betting companies that were publicly traded here in London, but were doing rather questionable activities inside America. We never took part in any of those American, uh, I would describe, uh, illicit activities that were going on during that time period. And that's afforded us the much longer term opportunity to go into America and be a supplier of our enterprise software uh, technology application to land-based casinos that want to move online. And again, in 2010, the laws had not changed. Still, in America, no Americans were allowed legally to gamble online playing casino games. Didn't mean it didn't happen. Doesn't mean you can't find websites hosted in marginal places, what I call sunny places for shady people, on the edges of America. That absolutely did take place and cont continues to take place today. But America is a bit different to Europe. They're quite strict. They, they believe in criminal sanction, and they've got a rather alarming habit of dragging people off airplanes and putting them into Rikers Island, if you ever heard of that place. So by and large, uh, the shady people living in sunny places tend to steer clear of America. And America has, since broadly speaking, uh, 2011, 20, 2012, been a bit of a no-fly zone for most uh, internet casino, sports betting, or other online gambling operators. And then comes GAN. And we sit down with these casino executives and we accept the challenge and we say, okay, you may not have the benefit of laws that allow you to launch internet casino gaming right now, but we're gonna try and figure that out for you. And it's been a labor of love for my entire leadership team spread across London, where we've originated as a business, uh, but also in Las Vegas, where, where I'm dual resident as an individual and uh, spend a lot of my time uh, with what I describe as the bridge of the ship uh, being in Vegas, which is the epicenter of the casino industry. And we figured out a number of different things that we can do for America's casinos, even though regulation hasn't necessarily yet come in any meaningful way to America. And I will talk to you about exactly where America is today when it comes to regulation and permission of internet casino gaming. I'm gonna try and skip through this to make it desperately efficient so we can get some questions. No such thing as a bad question. Uh, there's no judgment here tonight. If you are an internet casino gambler and have used an internet casino, uh, I very much welcome and support that. Congratulations, be careful. Uh, but, uh, but, but I'm very, very happy to take even the most basic question about what internet casinos are and how they function. So as and when uh, we provided this presentation to the good people here at Shares, um, we're traded on AIM. We have about 70 million shares uh, in issue there. We have, uh, on top of that, about five million shares uh, extant as awarded options. Uh, and in addition to that, we have a convertible uh, debt note of two million sterling that may convert in the future over the next five years at 45 and a half P. 
with market cap around about 26 million sterling, and net cash reported at the beginning of this quarter was 3.2 million sterling. Here's our journey, and I already touched on it, really, in 2010, for me, it started with that challenge from the casino executives. What is it that you guys can do to get us online and engaging with our customers who frequent our casinos? And uh, although you may not believe this, I will uh, give you some, some significant insight into the way Americans engage with their local casinos. About one in three Americans regularly and routinely go and visit their casino property just down the road. Most Americans live within a 20, 30 minute drive of a huge casino, and the, the most active casino patrons uh, will visit on average once a week. It's an extraordinary relationship, which I don't believe really exists here in London. In London, casinos tend to be smoky little back rooms uh, parked on the edge of Mayfair, designed to serve traveling businessmen who want to gamble outside of the usual uh, purviews of their, their social environments. Uh, in America, it's very much a mainstream activity. Uh, in America, it's dominated by slot machines, and roughly 70% of all the revenues generated inside casinos come from these slot machines. The industry itself, every year, generates $70 billion in revenues. And we have a number of these clients signed up and using something, which I'm going to have to take you through in some detail, and I will invite you to suspend a degree of disbelief. We call that simulated gaming. Simulated gaming is the solution that we came up with for land-based casinos. OK, you're a casino in Oklahoma. Uh, and this is an example client of ours. Uh, you have surveyed your customers, and you realize that about half of them are playing slots online for free with other people. They're not playing with you. They're playing with any one of 3,000 different mobile slots applications you can download onto your mobile phone. You want to get involved in that market? You can do that. You can hire GAN to build you an online casino, a simulated gaming online casino, where your patrons, uh, particularly patrons who have reward cards, which are like Tesco club cards, if you come across those, uh, using which they can generate what I call air miles for gamblers. The more they gamble inside the, the land-based casino, the more points they accumulate, and they can use those points for a free buffet or free hotel room stay or even additional incremental free gambling on the slot machines. Uh, we launch these simulated online casinos. We create a website. We create a mobile website. We create a mobile app on Apple and on Android. And then suddenly, the casino is telling its patrons that they're now online with, a, with an online casino, uh, and it's offered for entertainment only. Because the crucial difference between real money online gambling here in Europe, which we're all familiar with, I suspect, and simulated gaming available in the US, is that it's all cash in and no cash out. You buy virtual dollars with your credit card or in-app purchases. You then gamble those virtual dollars, and you feel like a virtual millionaire. You may be a, a penny slot player inside the casino, but online, you've got $5 million in your online casino account that you purchased for maybe 100 bucks. You feel like a fantastically wealthy real money gambler. You're gambling at home, and you're doing it principally for entertainment purposes. But there's something else at play here, and there's something else is that the typical casino patron who decides to create an account online, purchase fake dollars, and gamble, the principal thing they're doing is practice playing at home online in preparation for going back to the casino that they visit once a week. Because they have a belief that in practicing at home, they'll be a better gambler when they go back to the casino. Again, I asked you to suspend disbelief, but this is the reality. We ask the casino patrons of America what they're doing, and they will typically say, yep, that's the number one reason. It gives me the sense of the thrill of the casino property. It gives me the excitement of being there even when I can't get there. Maybe the weather is bad and I can't drive there. Or maybe I'm simply broke and I don't have enough money to go and, and gamble inside the casino. But typically, it's about these Casino Patrons of America consuming and heavily engaging with one of the most exciting online entertainment products from their perspective, based on their existing proclivities uh, inside these land-based casinos where they gamble real money for, um, for real casino entertainment. So simulated gaming is one of the most extraordinary business opportunities that we've seen. We launched it in early tw uh, 2014, a couple of months after we'd launched Real Money Gambling in New Jersey. And we're the only company in America that has both real money gambling going on in the state of New Jersey, 
uh, which up until relatively recently was, was one of only three American states that permitted its residents to gamble online, and simulated gaming that was going on across the country with our various casino clients who'd launched a fake online casino through a partnership with GAN. And we realized that the activity was staggeringly similar. Very, very similar. The total amount of money deposited and lost through real money casino gaming in New Jersey every single day was very, very similar to the amount of money being used in simulated gaming to purchase fake money and gamble and ultimately lose that fake money and then purchase some more. The advantage of simulated gaming is that there's, there's no tax consequence. Real money online gaming, like everywhere in the world, is quite heavily taxed. In New Jersey, it's taxed, I believe, about 17.5% on total losses by gamblers who live in the state of New Jersey. Uh, simulated gaming has no such tax. The cost of bonuses when you give free money to a gambler online in New Jersey, that's a fully costed expense. You actually have to charge that to the PL. Typically, internet casinos in New Jersey run at between 10% of revenue and 20% of revenue in free bonuses, what I call bribe money to keep the players playing and excited about being your customer online. Simulated <coughs> gaming, no cost of bonusing. I can give $500 million to one of our VIP players and not break sweat over it, knowing that that VIP player will plow through it within uh, the course of a wet weekend and then proceed to, to, to purchase yet another tranche of fake money. So it's officially one of the best high margin income streams that we've seen in various different internet gambling markets that we've been active in over the course of the last 16 years. So simulated gaming not only is unique to GAN, but it's a very high margin revenue stream that we generate for our land-based casino customers who decide to move online with this exciting form of entertainment to engage their customers uh, more aggressively. And there's an overlay on top of that. So one of the things that we've proven is that uh, we get more customers back to the casino. And this is incredibly important. Not only do we generate new incremental income, a greater share of the wallet from their existing customers, we also get that customer to be more loyal to the casino property. The reality is casino patrons are promiscuous. They like to visit multiple casinos in America. They may well live to, uh, close to a casino, uh, but a bit further, uh, a slightly further drive away, they have another two or three casinos in their area. So they will have a predominant relationship with their nearest casino. But every few weeks, they'll go and visit a different casino. Uh, maybe they'll go take a trip to Vegas. Maybe they'll go down to Atlantic City. They're promiscuous. By launching simulated gaming online and engaging the patron at home, where they can practice play online, and as they spend money, they accumulate these air miles for gamblers, these all-important reward points, it increases the relationship and significantly increases the propensity of those customers to go back and visit their casino. And this is a super important reveal because not only does simulated gaming engage with the patron, but it, it strengthens and augments the existing bricks and mortar retail relationship that the casino has with their existing customers. And the increased wallet share is super important. We've shone a light on how much money is being spent by America's casino patrons. And we believe America's casino patrons represent uh, approximately 10% of all the American players who are playing these, these fake slot machines online, but they actually generate more than two thirds of the revenues. So how much, how much money is America spending fake gambling online every year? Well, it's in the public domain, it's about $3 billion. So the casino patrons, the type of people who like going and gambling inside casinos, generate the vast majority of that $3 billion annually, even though they represent a relatively small minority of the overall, overall number of people playing online. Uh, these KPI numbers, I believe you're all going to get a copy of this presentation. This is in the public domain. Uh, we've broken out the business quite neatly into the various different business units of ours. Uh, but suitably upward pointing graphs, lots of growth going on. Very excited. It's a good, good market to be in. And uh, it's a seasonally impacted market. You know, Typically, it's northern hemisphere. So during the summer, you get a little bit less play. During the winter periods, you get a lot more play. Uh, but the, the KPI information is well laid out, so I'm just going to skip through these three slides. Uh, cost base. Our cost base has been under very, very tight control since we went public uh, a little over four years ago. There's a very good reason for that. When we went public in November 2013, uh, it was a very exciting time. We had three American states 
regulate real money gambling. We had New Jersey go, which I've already touched on. We had Delaware go, it's about a million people live in Delaware, very small market. And Nevada went with about two and a half million people back in 2013. It's slightly grown now to about three million people. So only 4% of Americans in 2013 were allowed to play online with real money internet casino. And in Nevada, it's actually not internet casino, it's internet poker only, which tends to be quite a, a modest product from a, a financial opportunity standpoint. Since then, we've been staring into the abyss of delayed regulation. We've crawled through America and four years up until October 30, when we woke up and we found to our great surprise and delight that the Pennsylvania governor had signed a piece of paper that legislated and regulated internet gambling uh, in the state of Pennsylvania. That doubles overnight the number of Americans who can gamble online legitimately, and the market's believed to start sometime around Q2 of next year, from our perspective. Might be a bit delayed, but we think Q2 is a pretty good window for the launch of real money internet casino gaming in Pennsylvania. So the market's gone from 4% of Americans can play online to 8% of Americans can play online, and we think over the course of the next four or five years, regulation will continue. In the interim, since 2013, when we realized that regulation was not coming, we refocused the business on simulated gaming. We saw our first client's results emerge in summer 2014, and we decided that, that was the business we had to concentrate on while we waited for incremental regulation to come to pass. With Pennsylvania now regulated, uh, it's a very grown-up state from the perspective of local politics. A lot of other states are now looking at it very seriously. We believe Michigan, New York, Illinois, other major states are now looking quite aggressively at passing regulation for internet gambling. Um, I'm aware of the, the time symbols over there suggesting I've only got four minutes left. So I, I'm hoping I'm, I'm hitting the high points of a very long, uh, sometimes dry presentation. But I'm obviously very happy to... Uh, meet any of you uh, after the, the Q&A session and go into some detail. But we've controlled our cost base extremely well. Uh, one of the ways we control our cost base is by building a Bulgarian engineering team to support the core engineering team that is here in London. So we've managed to reduce costs at the same time as increasing our engineering capacity to serve our clients in America. And the way I like to describe it is we design in London, we engineer in Bulgaria, and we sell in America. And the vast majority of our revenues today are coming from America, and the majority of our revenues from America are coming from simulated gaming. Here's a quick valuation matrix for you to, to noodle on. Um, this was actually updated only a few days ago, but uh, just before our interim results, I think this arrow was hovering in between one and a half and two. So we've obviously jumped up a little bit uh, through some uh, strong market trading, but we still remain substantially below our peer group. Uh, and I think in America, there's a typical sales multiple on an enterprise software business like GAN of about five times. So the typical multiple is up here. Majority of our revenue today is coming from America, and we continue to believe that America will contribute the bulk of our economics going forwards. So I would hope that the, the equity story and the equity delta opportunity is meaningful for you here to consider today. Here's the map of regulation. So here are all the states that are considering uh, and have pieces of legislation bouncing through the mercurial political systems at the state level. Uh, federal uh, gambling has not come to pass, and we don't necessarily believe it will come to pass, but the individual states in America have been given carte blanche, if they want to, to license, regulate, and permit internet gambling. Pennsylvania is just gone. Neighboring New Jersey went in 2013. Tiny little Delaware poked over there, and Nevada actually regulated internet poker, but uh, uh, no internet casino and no internet sports betting at the moment. So we think regulation uh, is a thing now in America. I think a lot of uh, disbelief entered into our equity story in the aftermath of our IPO quite correctly because regulation simply didn't happen at the pace that everybody believed it, uh, and some degree of confidence has come back into the marketplace, which is reflected in the, the, the relative evolution of our stock price uh, since the passing of legislation in Pennsylvania on October 30. Um, we hope for more regulation, but we haven't built a business that is completely contingent on regulation. We've actually built a brand new business in the form of simulated gaming, and the merits of that business are extremely strong. And I would suggest that if you are investigating and considering the business case or the investment case, 
uh, for GAN, I would strongly invite you to consider, even sign up and play on the simulated gaming websites and try and get your head around why so many of America's casino patrons are currently engaging with our simulated online casino experience. Gross income. So the top line, the big number, this is all sterling. Uh, the top line is a proxy for what I describe as GAN-enabled revenue. This is the total amount of money that we make for our clients, both here in Europe and in the US. It's not a complete proxy. It's roughly about two-thirds of the total amount of money we generate for our clients. And then our net revenues is what we keep to pay our bills. It's principally revenue share based, so we like that because it scales as our, as our clients grow their businesses. Uh, there's some professional services fees in there. We get paid on a, on a handsome time cost plus basis to do complicated uh, software development works. Crucially, anything we build is our intellectual property. That's a very important point to make. And our enterprise software application system developed right here in London represents a highly scarce asset. Uh, and this scarce asset is something which isn't widely available today. Uh, we're just about to deliver our first full year EBITDA positive period since, uh, since uh, 2014. It's a great privilege for me to stand in front of you tonight and, and explain that in some detail. Uh, but we expect the, the EBITDA growth to continue throughout the course of, of next year. And I would very much invite uh, any of you to give me some questions because I know I'm completely out of time at this point. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. I'll just go okay. forward to, oh, sorry. Okay, well, you can Thank say you. that side. Do you have any questions, Dermot, please? Gentleman here, thank you. Uh, I appreciate there was a long single cycle in signing up uh, new simulated uh, gaming clients. Yep. But based on the evidence and the number of clients you have, are those conversations becoming easier? The conversations are becoming easier, but we're, we're actually becoming a lot more selective about which clients we want to take on board. And if you look at the summer autumn period of this year, uh, we've been incredibly selective because we, we had a little bit of a heads up that Pennsylvania might regulate, uh, regulate or might come to regulate. And so we wanted to keep a lot of our technology resources free and available for our existing client, Parks Casino, which is the market leader in Pennsylvania. Um, so it, it's, it's always a bit of a balancing act. You can't be too aggressive in signing up casinos because when you do, darn it, you have to deliver for them. And that means it ties up a proportion of your technology resources in delivering for our customers. So we very deliberately uh, took, the, took the foot off the sales uh, deal-making trail in order to be ready for Pennsylvania in case it regulated, which of course it did. So a sort of slowdown in new sales should be expected then? I, I believe we'll, we'll get another sale in simulated gaming between now and the end of the year. That's certainly what I've messaged to the market. I believe there are multiple incremental uh, customers and customer accounts that we want to win, but we need to be ready for Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania is a very significant technology exercise. Uh, we think it's going to launch in Q2. It's a very major opportunity for our client and ourselves as their real money gaming platform provider. So we want to get it right and have them ready to go as, as soon as reasonably possible. And that's been the message from the client to us. And, I'm, uh, I'm ensuring that our technology resources are suitably dedicated on delivering their needs. Okay. Gentleman at the back in the corner, please, Chris. Mm. Chris? Okay, not listening. Hi. Um, what drives the American politics on gaming, and uh, was Trump good for it? Uh, money. Very simple. So Pennsylvania has actually come up with a, with a rather unique wheeze. Uh, the wheeze is going to result in an estimated $110 million immediate cash upfront windfall for the state. Now, anything north of 20 million bucks really gets the attention of state politicians. Uh, what Pennsylvania has done as a very major, generally deemed grown-up political state, they created a framework which can now be copied by other states who can simply point to Pennsylvania and say, hey, Pennsylvania made $110 million uh, out of their land-based casino industry by implementing gaming expansion, which includes iGaming, let's do the same thing. So it, it, the one singular driver of gaming expansion legislation is money and the needs for um, local state and politicians to avoid income tax increases and, in, and instead try and find incremental, perhaps new sources of, of state taxation. And part of the question was, has, has Trump had any impact? Has he had any view on Trump the... used to own a casino. Uh, Trump has, has been... You know, I think his public comment was, uh, I've got friends on both sides of the argument. I've got some people who are really into online gaming and some people are really against online gaming. Um, so I think he's neutral 
uh, when it comes to, to internet gaming at the federal level, but it's, it's, uh, he, he seems to be rather benign when it comes to the state regulation or continued regulation at the state level. Okay, gentlemen in the back. Thanks for the talk, Dermot. Um, allowing for localization, uh, software is obviously highly scalable. Um, I'm surprised in a way that you didn't mention or, or, or you must have considered Asia. In particular, Japan has a strong gaming culture, although not necessarily casino gaming. But yeah. have you considered uh, Asia as a possible marketplace? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the, the only market that is in many ways viable for us is the market of Macau. And in Macau, the land-based casino operators there uh, are very, very large, very similar to the American counterparts. The difference is they tend to generate about 10 times the revenues that Vegas does. The majority of the revenues, I think 70% come from mainland China and 30% from Hong Kong. Uh, when it comes to simulated gaming, I believe there's a lot of demand to do it in Macau, but the, the, the Macau regulator, the DICJ, is actually very anti anything online. So uh, I, I think as much as we would love to have a Macau casino as a client, uh, and as much as the client would love to launch simulated gaming online or even real money gambling online, until their regulator, who, who's just you know, still flat out getting their arms around a very complex land-based casino environment, uh, and, until they signal uh, are willing to permit their clients, the casino licensees, to launch online, we're simply in a holding pattern there. So I've spent a bit of time, met a lot of people, talked to a lot of folks, figured out the business a little bit. Uh, it's an extraordinary market. When it comes to online generally in Asia, it's all gray to black markets. You know, it's either, it might be illegal, but nobody knows, or it's absolutely definitely illegal, and there'd be dragons, literally. So we, we tend not to look at Asia. We're a, a completely regulated markets company. Every single dollar we make for our clients or for ourselves uh, is legal, no questions asked. And that's one of the key ways you can distinguish GAN from perhaps many other internet gambling companies that are out there in the marketplace. Thank you. Question, or oh, gentleman at the back there, please. Either. Um, there's a rather large Smurfit presence in this company. Um, could you tell us? Uh, you, I heard you speak about six weeks ago. Uh, and I really you. hope you bought. I did. <laughs> well thank, done. Thank you very much, and I'm very happy. But I, 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 it is now the price is now much nearer the share price at which the convertible uh, is convertible. Um, uh, where will? How, what will the Smurfit family? percentage be if that is converted? How much does the family own already? Yeah, we, we already own together uh, approximately 40% of the issued share yeah. capital. Um, the, the expectation and uh, current belief in the convertible note is that we, the company, will be in a position over the next four and a half years to repay that in full. So to give you an inside glance into the convertible, there is no meaningful expectation that we internally will uh, support the conversion of that. We simply you know, want to pay it back, if that helps you. I, I think it was underwritten by a member of your family. It was, correct. How much Sir, Mi it? Sir Michael Smurf had underwrote the two million sterling convertible note. It's a 9% convertible note. Uh, it's actually, it's a great product. Uh, and I wish you'd engage with us a little bit earlier so you get a, a slug of it. Uh, but it, so is, it is completely controlled by Sir Michael Smurf it. And uh, he is, you know, he's a wealthy man, and I don't believe uh, he is particularly excited by, uh, you know, having it converted. I think he just wants to give the company the ability to execute against the strategy and execute the business. And at some point, you know, assuming we deliver this business, which I believe we will, we'll be in a financial position to pay it back with significant thanks. And there's a 12-month interest rate penalty on it, as and when we do pay it back. And in a, in a zero interest rate policy environment, or near zero. A nine percent yield. It put a put put a big smile on an old man's face. So it's unlikely to take you over or the old family over fifty percent. Really, point. It, it it cannot take us over fifty percent. Yeah, that's right. Uh, gentleman here. Is there any pressure from the federal government to thwart the spread of internet gambling? I'm thinking of some of these very conservative midwits. Mid yeah, absolutely right. So there there are always these senators who come together in in. Uh, uh, from time to time uh, and make utterances. Um, you know, Lindsey Graham is a senator who's been very outspoken in his negative attitude towards internet gaming. We have a firm belief, as does 
the industry in general and the internet uh, casino analysts in particular, that that will always continue. But the genie is firmly out of the bottle, not just the three states are regulated in 2013, but also Pennsylvania <laughs> regulating. It marginalizes uh, the risk of a federal level ban, particularly during the Trump administration where he's firmly sat on the fence and said, look, I've got friends on both sides of the argument. So uh, we don't believe that there's any meaningful risk that, that a federal ban on internet gaming uh, will be implemented. And in fact, all the individual state senators have been very vocal in coming together and sending uh, warning letters to the, the White House administration to say this is a state's rights issue. We can regulate and implement internet casino gaming if we want to. And that's very well documented in the public domain. So it's a, a smart question, uh, but I believe the risk is not there.